Okay, welcome everyone. Um, welcome to the Whitney and Betty McMillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale. My name is Alex Debs and I'm an associate professor here in the political science department. Normally, Ian Shapiro, the di director of the McMillan Center, would be introducing uh, the speaker today, but unfortunately he's teaching at this moment, and so he's, he can't be here and he sends his regrets. We're happy with you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy to be filling in for him, and we're delighted to host uh, Christopher Andrew as this year's Henry L. Stimson Lecturer. Christopher Andrew is an Emeritus Professor of Modern and Contemporary History at the University of Cambridge. He's the founder of the Cambridge Intelligence Seminar and founding co-editor of Intelligence and National Security. He's also chair of the British Intelligence Study Group and former official historian of the British Security Service, MI5. He's honorary professor at Queen's University, Belfast, and former visiting professor at Harvard University, the University of Toronto, and the University of Canberra. Professor Andrew's latest book, The Secret World, A History of Intelligence, analyzes the period from Moses to Putin, and it's the basis for his lectures this week. So I, I think we'll have a good coverage here. His previous books on the use and abuse of intelligence, including The Sword and the Shield, The World Was Going Our Way, and Defend the Realm, have appeared on bestseller lists on four continents. Professor Andrew is here to give three lectures on the lost history of global intelligence and why it matters. Today is the first of the three, and it's titled, How the Lead Role in Strategic Intelligence Passed from Asia to the West. The next lecture will be tomorrow, and it's titled, The Strange History of American-British Intelligence Relations from George Washington to Donald J. Trump. And then the third lecture will be on Thursday, and it will be entitled, Russian Intelligence Operations and the West from Tsar Nikola II to Vladimir Putin, and I hope you will join us again for both of them. <coughs> a word on format, so Professor Andrew will speak for about an hour, uh, and then we'll have a Q&A for 30 minutes. So I will please ask you to reserve your questions until the Q&A period, and when, this is, uh, when we're done with the Q&A around 6, there will be a reception in the common room just uh, behind you. Uh, let me add, the funding for the lecture series comes from an anonymous don donor in honor of Henry L. Stimson, uh, Yale College, 1889, an attorney and statesman whose government service culminated with his tenure as Secretary of War during World War II. Uh, since 1998, the Macmillan Center and Yale University Press have collaborated to bring distinguished diplomats and foreign policy experts to the center to lecture on their books that are published by the Yale Press. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Christopher Andrew. Let me begin by saying what an honor it is uh, to be giving the Henry L. Stimson lectures for many reasons, which include the fact that he had access to a more extraordinary set of secrets over an unprecedented period than anybody else just about that I can think of in the history of the United States. So it began in his junior year at Yale when he was in uh, Skull and Bones. And it didn't even quite end at the end of the Second World War. But he was involved in the most terrible single decision ever taken by any world government, the decision to explode the world's first uh, atomic bomb. So to have the privilege of talking about um, some of his secrets and what he did with them is something that I highly appreciate. So. What's the first thing I think to notice about um, the way that he dealt with his extraordinary secrets? I think the first thing <clears throat> is that he changed his mind about these secrets more than any really major figure in American history who has ever had access to secrets of this um, uh, importance. So <clears throat> in his diplomatic um, uh, career, um, he becomes Secretary of State um, under the Hoover administration, Republican administration, of course, in 1929. He's confronted with the kind of intelligence which shortened the Second World War, even though people argue about how much it shortened the, the Second World War, SIGINT, as it was called at the time. In other words, the intelligence derived from intercepting and, when necessary, decrypting other people's communication. What was his attitude to that? It was entirely un 
ethical. And he insisted that the State Department stop it. And it did. And he closed down the Black Chamber, not the official name, but that's what most people called it. And yet, when he comes back as Secretary of War under the Roosevelt administration at the beginning of the Second World War, what does he ask for? As much SIGINT as possible. What his diaries, which are in the Sterling Library, say, that the most exciting thing that had ever happened to him um, was the uh, Japanese uh, SIGINT at the beginning of um, the Second World War. So here we are. This is what his library, his diary says um, in uh, Sterling Library. He recalls wonderful progress made by US code breakers. Quote, I can't even go in my diary, go into some of the things that they have done. Well, what couldn't he go into? The main thing that he could not go into was the success in breaking the Japanese diplomatic cipher, which the Americans, but not the Japanese, called purple. Oh, that, of course, produced an immediate uh, interdepartmental problem. The army wanted sole responsibility for the diplomatic code. Um, you know, they accepted that the navy should be able to break if they could, which they couldn't at that point, the naval codes and um, vice versa. So what was agreed? Um, forgive me for putting it like this, but the silliest interdepartmental agreement in the entire history of the United States, and that is a challenge which <laughs> I should be really excited if somebody can think of a worst example. So this is the official formula. It was agreed after lengthy negotiations that the Army and Navy would exchange all diplomatic traffic from their intercept facilities. So when they got these coded messages, they passed them on to the other. The Army would receive all purple traffic of days with an even date, 2, 4, 6, 8, and so on. And the Navy all traffic of days with an odd date, 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. Huh. Not a very good idea, I'm sorry. Um, so. Why did they do this? Well, you know, um, the, the, just about the oldest platitude about learning from the, uh, the past, and by the way, the only way that platitudes get to be platitudes is by being true. Um, the, about the oldest platitude is only those who understand past mistakes um, can learn from them. And those who don't are doomed to repeat them. So had the history of intelligence been known, this idiotic agreement would have been absolutely impossible because um, the Stimson and the FDR administration would have known that the French tried this, a kind of complete chaos. The British had tried it, complete chaos. The Russians had tried it, an even worse chaos. And the idea that they would have done it again, no, not even plausible. And of course, what it caused was um, chaos in the White House as well. I mean, the, the military and the naval aides found it too difficult to swap responsibilities for this every other day. So they did it every other month. And there's General Edwin Parr Watson, FDR's military aide, but also a close uh, friend, who is uh, so confused by the odd even date signal uh, that he starts filing some in his waste paper basket and he's denied access altogether in July 1941. And there's the the naval aide, who could tell the difference between odd numbers and um, e even numbers, and uh, uh, so he becomes the sole uh, supplier. Now, what does this produce? Um, I mean, as, as usual in history, conspiracy theories um, get uh, far more attention than simple human incompetence. But we all know from our professional lives that when something goes badly wrong, it is usually because people have been incompetent rather than they've thought of a really interesting conspiracy. So here we are, Saturday the 6th of December, 1941. The Navy makes the original intercept, and to its immense annoyance, six is an even date, so it has to hand it over to the Army. And it does hand it over to the Army. But the Army has no money on Saturdays to get people in in the afternoon, so they have to hand it um, uh, back. And then the Army does get some money in the evening, so they cooperate for the first time. And uh, all the detail uh, of uh, uh, this, by the way, I think is so well established in so many official reports. It's simply that the sheer incompetence of Saturday the 6th of December hasn't uh, attracted a fraction of the attention of the non-existent conspiracies of the, the same time. Now, who's the first person to really notice this? This man, Sherman Kent. Yale historian, founder of CIA, Cold War Intelligence Assessment, and also involved in that in uh, 
OSS in uh, World War II. And he's the first person to articulate the proposition that there is no future for American intelligence unless it learns from the past, and in particular, learns from the errors of uh, the past. And that's what he says. And by the way, the, way, the um, School for Intelligence Analysis at CIA headquarters, uh, where I will be speaking on this uh, American um, uh, tour, is named in his honor. So here's my experience. Um, but um, I think it extends to both sides of the Atlantic because this extraordinary intelligence headquarters whose mere existence was kept secret for 30 years after the, the, the Second World War but is now the first um, British intelligence headquarters to become a tourist site, Bletchley Park. And the scene of the greatest intelligence collaboration between two powers since there were uh, different numbers of powers. So. Uh, beginning my career in, in Cambridge quite some years ago, because the people who were recruited to Bletchley Park were very young, I was able to talk to them about their experience. I was fascinated by what they knew. But in the end, I think I was also the first person to be fascinated by what they didn't know. Now, the, uh, the, the brilliant young academics from all kinds of disciplines, some of them historians, political scientists, uh, and so on, it didn't occur to any of them, by which I mean not a single one, that the extraordinary achievements of Bletchley Park had been equaled by previous British codebreakers at uh, terrible moments of, of uh, national crisis. So three times in the last 500 years, Britain has faced invasion from forces greater than its own. It thought it was about to be invaded by Hitler in 1940. It wasn't, but it was a sensible idea that uh, Hitler certainly wanted to. But those who broke Hitler's codes had the slightest idea that their early 19th century predecessors had broken Napoleon ciphers during the uh, Peninsular War. And as if you've been to Britain, as I imagine everybody has, you can see the Martello Towers that were put up all around the, uh, the south coast in order to protect us against an invasion which didn't happen. Uh, I haven't left myself time for that. And that's the breaking of the code which you can find in, if you have time in the British National Archives. And the people who broke Napoleon ciphers had the slightest idea that during the, um, the previous main invasion threat, leave out, by the way, the Glorious Revolution, because King Billy, William of Orange, was invited in, so that doesn't count. No, Philip II of Spain, the Spanish Armada of 1588. Well, Philip II's ciphers were broken just as a few hundred years later Napoleon's were, and a few hundred years, 150 years after, after that, uh, Hitler's were. Uh, so, you know, <clears throat> because Siggins sounds very modern, the idea that Franklin Delano Roosevelt understood it better than Queen Elizabeth I, it's, it's a common idea, even though nobody else, actually he wasn't nearly as good as Queen Elizabeth I. I'm not saying he wasn't better than Queen Elizabeth I in a number of um, areas. He was, but not when it came to um, uh, code breaking. So there we are. And the, the, all the detail of how the ciphers were broken by Elizabeth I's code breaker, whose name is pronounced Tol Thomas Phillips, but he was rather dyslexic, so it's called Philippus. Um, uh, I haven't got time. What, what, what is astonishing? Here is a code breaker in the 1580s who is personally complimented by the Queen herself. He would not believe in how good part the Queen accepted of your service. She awarded him a royal pension. FDR didn't do that to absolutely anybody um, during the longest presidency in the history of the United States. Um, I haven't left time to talk about Sixtus V. But so now we move on to something which I hope, apart from being historical significant, will also be helpful during our next visit to Venice. Just about everybody here has been to Venice. And if you haven't, well, there's plenty of time. And here are a few things to look at which the guides won't tell you. So when does Europe begin to get really good at SIGINT and take the lead from Asia? at the beginning of the Renaissance, and it has the most beautiful intelligence headquarters in the history of intelligence. The United States has never sought to compete uh, for the most beautiful intelligence um, and, uh, headquarters. So there we are. Here's what you get shown anyway, and here's what you will only get shown if you ask to see. So this is where the Council of, of Ten talked about all the official secrets. 
And uh, then if you, you know, you have to ask to see this, the secular inquisitors who were supposed to be uh, responsible for state security, they could have anybody they wanted to paint the um, uh, fresco. So they got Tintoretto, uh, the prodigal son on the ceiling of the I have been to um, um, most American intelligence headquarters. I've yet to see, sorry, I don't want to be um, uh, diminished, and the same is true as Britain. The level of artistic patronage is pathetic. Sorry, I <laughs> left my... <laughs> and then <clears throat> they've still got around, there are just a couple of them, there used to be more. How do you denounce a traitor in 16th century Venice? There's a special letterbox. Look at this fellow. Uh, where his, um, his mouth is, that's where you put the letter uh, denouncing people. <laughs> Now, I am against that, but uh, the artistic quality is uh, um, far higher than the FBI have ever even thought about. But this is where you really have to uh, ask, what is most original in this extraordinary building? It's the world, the Europe's first SIGINT agency, which is on the top floor. And so there are these cramped rooms which are divided laterally into two, which means that in summer they're appalling because you can only open the windows if you have access to the, uh, both floors uh, at the same time. And um, there's something about co-breakers. I mean, they're, they're, very, they're very modest in their requirements. So here is the best co-breaking organization in the history of the world until that point, Bletchley Park. And they're put in missing huts. And, um, you know, when the United States uh, somewhat later has far more, you know, if there is an ugly, I'm sorry if I, I mustn't get carried away, if there is an uglier intelligence headquarters in the entire history of intelligence headquarters, I would be jolly surprised. And in, I, do not expect, I do not expect to be surprised. No, I haven't got time for him. I haven't got time for him. Um, but what's extraordinary is that the Venetians, who think that they are well ahead, particularly of anything that the Ottomans could, could do, it's complete nonsense. Their major theoretical breakthrough is exactly the same has been, as had been made by the Baghdad House of Wisdom in the, um, uh, the ninth um, uh, century. And here's the man, of course, there's no um, like a real likeness, Al-Kindi. And um, this is his crucial text. But the problem from the point of view of um, Islam is that um, uh, from the moment that the Ottomans um, become the main uh, Muslim power from the moment that they take Constantinople. They can't be doing all this. So they throw his stuff away. And it is not discovered again till 1987. My book um, contains details of which library to look at if you want to have a look at the, um, uh, the original. And of course, there's also absolutely no idea that um, uh, Mohammed, on the, ba the basis of the evidence that I'm about to summarize, had a far better grasp of intelligence than any secular, or for that matter, non-secular European leader in the Middle Ages. So this book, The Sealed Nectar, is the best-selling Muslim biography of uh, Muhammad, and it describes him as, as, as do the others, the greatest military leader in the entire world, which for the non-faithful is obviously debatable. But um, according uh, to uh, the conventional version, he fights 27 battles. He instigates about 50 armed raids, playing close atten in, uh, attention to military intelligence. Now, you don't find that in the Quran, obviously, because the Quran is about the message, not the messenger. But if you look in the Hadith, which record his deeds and sayings, there is more intelligence there than you will find in any medieval text about a Western leader. Uh, so all this needs paying some attention to. But nowadays, about the only people who pay attention to it are the Islamists. So here is a typical Al-Qaeda training manual, which you'll find on the web if you want to. The Prophet, Allah bless him and keep him, had local informants in Mecca who told him everything big and small that might harm the Muslims' welfare. Um, right, well, <clears throat> uh, the problem is the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire is a great power, the greatest Mediterranean, um, uh, Mediterranean power but um, it despises um, in intellectual uh, innovation. So after their conquest of Constantinople, the Ottomans refused to allow an Arabic printing press until the end of the 18th century. They refused to establish embassies, permanent embassies abroad, which are the basis for um, uh, Western 
uh, espionage. So they're doomed to um, a decline. And Venice takes over. Why Venice? Well, because it has the biggest um, trading empire of the, the Middle Ages, and it needs political as well as commercial intelligence in order to keep that. No time to talk about that. And they, what, what's next? Well, the, uh, the age of discovery. Now, obviously, impossible to take all the detail in there, but the arrows give you some sense of um, how important uh, it was. So all one's got to do is to compare European maps of um, the, the 16th century with Asian maps to see why Europe has now overtaken Asia. So this is a very well-known map. You can find it on the web, the Salviati uh, world map. But 1525, notice how quickly the Western image of the world has changed. It shows the New World coastline which had only been discovered since Columbus's first um, voyage in 1492. And it also indicates, which is really important, the awareness that just don't know what the rest of the world consists of. So China. The first map in China which shows any part of the New World at all is 1602. That's not produced by a Chinese cartographer. It's produced by a Western Jesuit missionary. So here's the best known <coughs> early bit of European uh, imperialism, Spanish conquest of the New World, which is a classic example of using intelligence as a force multiplier against a civilization which doesn't even understand it. Plenty of other things it did understand, but not that. So here is Fernando Cortez. Now the odds are unbelievably great. Uh, people argue about um, uh, whether um, uh, the Aztecs had a, uh, um, a, um, how many hundreds of thousands of uh, men they had to put up against him. What is not in doubt is that Cortes has only 600 men with him. But they beat this huge and sophisticated empire in two years. And how do they do it? They do it by in, in intelligence. So there's Cortes and La Malincha, who was a young slave uh, woman who had an extraordinary gift for languages, indeed in extraordinary intellectual gifts uh, anyway. And they're meeting um, with the man I pronounce as, as Montezuma, but it's, I should be able to do better than that, but, um, uh, but I can't. Um, so what she is telling him all the time is that Montezuma is beatable. Why? Because most of his vassals and uh, all of his, his rivals absolutely hate him. So in the end, the 600 people because they're able to get an alliance uh, against him. It's not as simple as that, of course, but uh, that is an essential part in the force multiplier. Now, here is the, um, uh, the absolute role model. So Francis Walsingham, um, uh, Elizabeth I's intelligence uh, chief, and at, uh, at the time it was possible to combine these two roles and it wouldn't be nowadays. The Queen sees Walsingham every day. So um, he is able to control the whole you know, SIGINT, HUMINT, and all the other INTs that I haven't left myself time to mention. And the other thing, it's absolutely essential if you're an intelligence chief that you dare to tell um, your um, uh, um, political um, uh, superiors what they don't want to know. So what one of Margaret Thatcher's uh, intelligence chiefs said at one point was, my job was to tell the Prime Minister what she did not want to know. And that is why ultimately Putin's intelligence um, is a mess. The idea of anybody uh, risking um, their future by telling him what he doesn't want to know is, is you know, the more autocratic you go to the, the regime, the more impossible that is. Now, we know there's one occasion in which Walsingham tells the, um, uh, the Queen something she doesn't want to know. She took her slipper off, threw it at him, and, and um, uh, got a direct hint. But that didn't stop him. You know, a moment which is to the inestimable credit, sorry about being patriotic, of um, brilliant British intelligence. No, I haven't got time to talk about them. No, not them. No, there's not time for them either. But um, you know, that's very interesting. I wish there were time uh, to talk about that. Now, one of the, one of the great things about um, looking at the influence that intelligence has had over the ages is how diverse um, the evidence is. Now, one of the few things in the, I um, can scarcely bring myself to pronounce the terrible B word Brexit there. I've done it once and will not do it again. <laughs> but the few areas in which Britain still leads the world is royal dresses. 
I mean, if there has been um, a program uh, on American television services uh, which has had um, higher um, uh, uh, viewer ratings than the last couple of royal uh, weddings, I would be surprised. But I am used to being surprised, so I might have got that wrong. Now, what nobody has noticed about Queen Elizabeth I's uh, but, uh, uh, dresses is that they would make important political points. Now, this is the last portrait of her. Um, not later than 1602, she died in 1603. You could not do a portrait of her unless uh, it was exactly as she wanted. So the first thing that you notice, look at the face, she is 29 and 3 quarters, and has been 29 and 3 quarters for the last half century, or, um, or almost that. But this dress is boasting about the fact that she has the best intelligence service anywhere. And um, you can tell that from the symbols. You can't see the symbols of that scale, but you can now. So wh what does this mean? Don't even think about it, traitors. My boys, and it was not an equal opportunity profession at the time, my boys can see everything you do and hear everything you say. The eyes and ears. And when MI5 was founded in 1909, it took one of her eyes, and uh, that became its um, symbol as well. Yes, well, <clears throat> the, what tends to be forgotten now, I mean, people, if rulers are not um, uh, assassinated, as most of them aren't, but quite a few of them have been, the view tends to be, oh, no problem, ma'am. Oh, yes, there was a problem. I mean, the nearest thing that Britain has to a national celebration and is going on at this very moment is uh, Guy Fawkes Day, when the Pope used to be burnt, I mean, just a symbol of the Pope, not actual Popes, um, and Guy Fawkes, who was the chief um, uh, plotter. I mean, it's the silliest national celebration in modern history, and it makes me really proud to be a Brit, um, <laughs> because, you know, just one shouldn't take it too seriously. So there's Guy Fawkes, who's the third from the right, and called Guido Fawkes, just to make him that bit much more uh, interesting. So... Because there is this extraordinary idea, as I've begun to say, that co-breaking and so on is something that only really clever people with amazing maths degrees in the 20th and 21st century do. The fact that it was sometimes more important in the 16th and 17th century is, um, is something that deserves more attention than it's so far uh, received. And have I got time to talk about this? Yes, I have. So another um, uh, Cambridge codebreaker, John Wallace, who was one of the founders of the Royal Society, the main scientific um, uh, society in um, uh, British history. And during the uh, English Civil War, the only time we've, uh, as you know, ends with the only time we've executed a mon monarch, he breaks Charles I's ciphers. And Charles I used them in order to communicate um, with his uh, French wife, who um, had understandably fled uh, abroad. And, and this is probably, no, I, I, I think I did look. I, it's, well, it's not in the Stirling Library, but goodness knows, it's an amazing amount. So Parliament, the Roundheads, the, the, the first Republicans in British history, in order to discredit the king, de publish his decrypted correspondence. And it tends to be forgotten that um, uh, early British Republicans were extraordinarily anti-feminist. And so one of the ways that they use against him is the argument that He's not merely bust around by his wife. But worse than that, it's a French wife. And even worse than a French wife, it's a French Catholic life. <laughs> um, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the royalists were not quite as anti-feminist as that. The king's councils are wholly managed by the queen, though she be of the weaker sex, born an alien, bred up in a contrary religion, yet nothing great or small is transacted without her privity and consent. <laughs> The queen appears to have been as harsh and imperious towards the king as she is implacable to our religion, nation, and government. So that's an end to her and him. And uh, as a reward for this, um, uh, John Wallace is uh, made professor of, it's called geometry, but actually it was mathematics, at Oxford uh, for, at the age of only um, 33. And he liked the job so much, he kept it for more than half a, uh, a century. Now, the same is true in French history. Great code breakers were more esteemed at the beginning of the 17th century than they have in any century, including, so far as I know, 
uh, the 21st. So here is uh, Cardinal uh, Richelieu, uh, who liked himself so much, he insisted that um, there were three different pictures of him on the same uh, uh, portrait. And there's his, his code breaker on the, on the right, Antoine Rossignol. Rossignol is a very appropriate name because uh, not um, uh, Millet does um, it, uh, uh, it, it, it refer to um, uh, the nightingale, but it's also French argot for a key that will pick any lock. And he is so appreciated that he is bought a chateau, this chateau, the Chateau de Juvisy. Now, uh, the Chateau de Juvisy um, is now in a degraded form. The Hôtel de Ville at Juvisy, which is only 20 miles from uh, Paris. But when he was there, Louis XIII went to see him and say how wonderful he was. Louis XIV um, uh, went to see him at the beginning of his reign. And so did, um, uh, so did of course, did Richelieu. Now, at no point in American or French history since has any codebreaker been shown that level of personal uh, esteem. So, no American president even goes to codebreaking headquarters until Ronald Reagan in 1986. Actually, he had to go there because um, um, he had uh, absent-mindedly uh, quoted some um, uh, highly classified uh, intercepted communications um, from Colonel Gaddafi, but uh, there we are, that was all, for, all forgiven. So, at the end of the 17th century, and again, just imagine this in British or American or French history at the end of the 20th. Charles Perrault of the Académie Française, which had been founded during the century, produces a book on the 40 most illustrious, les plus illustres, uh, Frenchmen of the 17th century. And he includes somewhere near the top. It's a great code breaker. So, you know, um, it's, um, we just don't understand, it seem, seems to be the background for um, all this. Now back to, uh, back to Asia. What tends to be forgotten about British intelligence is that for a period of about a couple of hundred years, it was actually more active in Asia than it was in Europe. And there's an obvious reason for that. And the obvious reason is that Britain is in the process of conquering India. And we tend nowadays to think of outsourcing in intelligence as something that is 20th century. Complete rubbish. There has never been a moment when Britain outsourced as much intelligence in the 20th or the 21st century as it did in the 18th and uh, 19th. So here is, a, here is a recent book on uh, the conclusion, possibly slightly overstated, but the, the author has a point, East India Company. Imagine a company with the influence of Google or Amazon, granted a state-sanctioned monopoly and the right to levy taxes abroad, and with MI6, British Foreign Intelligence, and the army at its disposal. So there we are. The East India Company official with escort of foot soldiers and Indian retainers, what you don't see are the intelligence officers. But the single best, at least so regarded in Britain, certainly Britain's leading historian of India in recent years, Sir Christopher Bailey, he reaches the conclusion the British conquered India in under two generations, not only because of their military superiority, but because they used a sophisticated intelligence system. And you know, if there's a turning point in the 18th century, it's the Battle of Plassey, and um, uh, Clive of India says exactly uh, the same. So, from the moment one starts looking at the outsourcing, it's extraordinary. This is the coat of arms of the British East India uh, Company, 1803, by which time the East India Company has a private army of 260,000, which is, I think, something like four times the current British army, three anyway, and was twice the size of the then British army. And it has more intelligence personnel than the government. Outsourcing has yet to even come close to getting what it was um, a couple of hundred years ago. And there's um, um, uh, the Duke of Wellington. It never even occurs to Napoleon that his main cipher had been broken by Wellington's intelligence staff during the Peninsular War. And that was the beginning of the end uh, for um, uh, Napoleon. But where did he learn the importance of uh, uh, military intelligence? Not in Europe. He learned it against the Marathas uh, in, uh, in India. So Victorian intelligence operations were on a much larger scale in India than Britain. This is what I was brought up to call uh, Calcutta, Calcutta nowadays, and there is um, 
uh, Queen Victoria lording it um, over the Indians with the assistance of one or two pigeons who are impertinently here. <laughs> so what all this then has is an influence on how intelligence develops in Britain. And you know, some of the things that on both sides of the Atlantic we take for absolute granted in the operations of um, in, in intelligence and for that matter, place things. Fingerprinting, for example, that was devised in British India in order to work on Indians. And then it was discovered that it also worked on Brits. And um, then the Americans discovered it also worked on Americans. But all this was uh, developed by Herschel, who was a magistrate in India. And those are some of the very early ones that he took in uh, 1859 and 60. So if you go through British intelligence the 19th and the first half of the 20th century, what you see is that some of the, the best practitioners had actually learnt their trade in India, including this man, Sir David Petrie, who was Director General of the and I-5's finest hours, the double cross system in World War II. His whole previous career had been in intelligence in India. And what um, historians of the British Empire are only just beginning to discover is that even after independence, the local uh, intelligence services, um, quite often not telling their governments, wish to keep in touch with the British. So here's something I found in the MI5 archives, 1957. Malik, he didn't have to say this. In my talks and discussions, I never felt I was dealing with any organization which was not my own. Besides this, the hospitality and kindness, which all of you showed me, it was also quite overwhelming. So, what I think of the exciting things about looking at the intelligence dimension, which is, of course, just a dimension. It is not, it cannot be, never will be the whole of human history. But the mere idea of doing gender studies, for example, without giving a really important role to um, um, uh, intelligence is something I find really a bit baffling. So here's the, breaking, um, the public breaking of the glass ceiling in Britain. The first um, uh, woman to become head of any of the world's major intelligence agencies is uh, this woman. I've been fortunate to interview her on it, uh, Stella uh, Remington. Now, this goes back to the First World War. And it's an interesting example um, of how you can arrive at what I think is fair to say is a feminist conclusion, starting from um, entirely different premises. So. At the beginning of the First World War, MI5 is very small because all able-bodied men are supposed to be off fighting and so it's only the non-able-bodied. And so the gents, when they're sitting around one evening, actually arrive at, and this is pretty much what they did arrive at, why don't we have the cleverest secretaries in British history? Not difficult, because people were not offering women interesting jobs. So. MI5 approaches two of the Oxford women's uh, colleges, Royal Holloway, which was the women's college then in uh, Oxford, and the Cheltenham Ladies College, which was the best known private school for Britain. Now, what you, what you then get then is the first organization in British history, and I would dare to say American history, but you know, open to, in which a high proportion of the women are not simply better educated, but actually come from higher up the social scale. Because for a woman uh, to go to university in Britain before the First World War meant that they had to come from pretty high up the social scale. Now, what's the response of the men to this? The men's response, <coughs> some really dislike the fact that their secretaries are cleverer than they are. Others are really grateful that their secretaries can actually understand the accounts, which uh, they can't. So it's, it's broadly speaking uh, positive. But this is a cartoon that was done um, during the First World War. Um, uh, which shows what I think is an everyday scene. So you, you see a smart 20-year-old something-year-old um, uh, secretary e e explaining to her boss, who's um, but twice her age and whose monocle has gone astray, what a document actually means. And as you can see, he doesn't really know how to respond to that. So wh what you get are some extraordinary careers, none more extraordinary than this woman, Jane Sismore, married name, uh, later Archie. She comes straight from school in 1916. Ten years later, she is accepted as MI5's leading 
Soviet expert, the leading Soviet expert in, um, uh, in Britain, um, British intelligence, and she qualifies with support from MI5 as a barrister in 1924. 30 years before, that would have been an impossible profession in anywhere in Britain. And then uh, also an another area, um, uh, this is not intended to be um, uh, too uh, frivolous, but just looking at the greetings cards um, uh, sent by f official bodies in Britain, you can arrive at, I think, really rather large conclusions. Now, it may seem silly to um, uh, devote so much effort to producing a New Year card. Um, but they did, and in the bottom left-hand corner, you can see, well, you might be able to see the initials of the man who designs it, E.H.W., uh, Eric Holt Wilson, uh, in vain it designed. And then in the bottom right-hand corner, there's Byam Shaw, who was the most expensive um, uh, illustrator uh, of the time. Now, uh, what's going on, and very few other people uh, on the 1st of January 1918 dared to predict that this would be the last year of the war. MI5, MI Roman 5 does so. And what you see is MI5's image is now female. It's a female masked Britannia. How do we know that beneath the mask is uh, MI5? Easy. Look at the end of her trident and you can see it's um, uh, MI Roman 5. And what she's doing is impaling the loathsome figure of subversion, which was always male and all, always impossibly her suit. There was no such thing as clean-shaven subversives in those days, at least so, so it, was, it, it was believed. And then if one looks at um, the, the, the parties. Now, you know, it's up to you to draw um, your own conclusions from these invitations. But these were the raciest invitations sent anywhere in, uh, in British officialdom, and they were drawn up by both men and women. And as you can see, this um, uh, young MI5 uh, 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 female operative has uh, borrowed her boss's cap, uh, and um, uh, she's um, uh, uh, got a little notebook which says MI5, so there's now. We now move to <coughs> the most interesting um, archive I have recently found in the University of Oxford. Uh, I come from Cambridge. We know there is interesting stuff there, but um, we don't go there all that often. Um, so this is the most attractive intelligence headquarters in British history. It wasn't designed uh, for intelligence, but it's Blenheim Palace. Uh, it's where Churchill was born. Uh, you can go there. You've probably already been there. So the majority of the personnel, they weren't, of course, allowed the best jobs, but the majority of personnel um, were female. But there, wasn't, uh, there weren't enough bedrooms there. So they were lodged at Keeble College, Oxford. And um, they had such a good time uh, that um, uh, Keeble College wrote to MI5 to complain that their dinner parties were simply outrageously uh, boisterous. Well, you may not be able to um, uh, see everything there, so I'll read a, a little bit out with you. In comparing our staff with undergraduates, um, and so on and so on, um, uh, anyway, MI5 insists they couldn't possibly have broken uh, all this crockery. It is difficult to envisage that, among other things, our staff have broken 28 large coffee pots, 740 plates of all sorts, and 104 dishes of sorts in the dining room, unless there has been a free fight, and so on. <laughs> so it's always been exciting in British intelligence. The point that I want to make is that Keeble College was complaining that for women it was actually too exciting uh, being in British intelligence to say, well, outrageous, but that's the kind of thing that Oxford colleges uh, say. Well, they don't actually very often. So, thanks chiefly to the Double Cross system, based mainly on double agents who feed disinformation to the enemy, World War II is MI5's finest hour so far. Now back to what they didn't know. You know, um, the it's only in the, the, the 20th century. The, f the fact that, you know, um, I can't pronounce this, uh, do forgive me, Sunza is the best that I can do. Actually, if I weren't here, I would probably say Sun Tzu, but um, anyway, contemporary uh, of, um, of, of Confucius. Required reading uh, at uh, West Point and lots of other places in the, um, uh, in the, United, um, uh, in the, in the United States. Uh, all warfare is based on deception. I don't think there's much doubt that the double-cross system 
was partly, but only partly, based on the teachings of Sunta. Um, and um, you know, it, here is an area in which it takes the West two millennia to catch up with um, some of um, the key uh, work of the Confucian era. Who's the man who does it? It's the first head of MI5. Why is it the first head of MI5? Because of Vernon Kell, who had been in China during the Boxer Rebellion at the beginning of the, of, of the century. He's a qualified Chinese uh, interpreter, and uh, probably, I think I would say, almost certainly, uh, the first Western intelligence officer to read The Art of War, and also the first to recruit double agents in World War I. Um, in order to, yes, but I'll go on for a little bit um, uh, uh, longer. But um, what I think has been lost sight of on this side of the Atlantic is that uh, two most successful First World War double agents were both Americans. Now, the first is uh, a good example of uh, one of the things that historians complain about in Britain, um, but um, uh, the intelligence services still regard as extremely important. If you tell somebody that if they become your agent, you will never, never, um, even their grandchildren and great-grandchildren will not know, then, I mean, that's extremely frustrating for a historian. There's a good argument against it, but you're far more likely to get good agents um, if you do that. And I have certainly come across uh, examples of um, people whose confidence in British intelligence derives largely from their ability to keep very old secrets indeed. So when I was official historian of MI5, I saw the Como file, I know who it was, and I'm not going to say, and neither with anybody else. And there's a good argument uh, that I should, but I'm not, um, Rosalind Whitock. Uh, he rather liked being it, so we know, um, we know his name. So you get over two millennia later, and it's really pretty unusual in human history that something of real importance only has its importance acknowledged in other continents after all that time. So here's Alan Dulles, head of the CIA, director of Central Intelligence, used to be called. Sunza deserves credit not only for the first remarkable analysis of the ways of espionage, but also for the first written recommendations uh, regarding any organized intelligence service. And there's um, uh, Kissinger, um, who concludes that Mao's foreign policy owed more to Sunza than to Lenin. There's quite good evidence of that. I don't read Chinese and therefore can't possibly say it's conclusive. But um, during the Long March, um, Mao did actually send for a copy of The Art of War. Uh, that is known. And an ironic moment in Chinese-American relations. When Hu Jintao uh, comes over in 2006, he presents George W. Bush with a silk-bound copy of The Art of War by Sun Tzu. And it's that one, I know, because it's in the Bush uh, Library now, and I haven't read it either. Well, I've read the... So then you get this extraordinary period in which Sun Tzu uh, actually becomes part of a US celebrity culture. This one you can still get, although I don't recommend it, uh, on, uh, on, on Amazon. How the timeless strategies of Sun Tzu can transform your game a likely story that Don Wade is, is and allows of no doubt on that. Then Sun Tzu for women on the left, uh, Sun Tzu, the art of war for, for managers, and then the real evidence of celebrity <laughs> culture, um, uh, Paris, uh, Paris Hilton. Um, and of course, nowadays, this is um, uh, the, the last Indian national security advisor. He says, and I don't believe him, that the Indian Arthur Shastra was equally important. No, it wasn't. What it does have is more about ways of assassinating people than any other book I've ever read. Um, so, but um, Menon's argument goes like this. Many Indians believe Orientalist caricatures of India. India's supposedly incoherent st strategic approach is actually a colonial construct, as is the idea of Indians somehow forgetting their own history and needing to be uh, taught by Westerners. So there. Um, now, um, my visit, I'm sorry to end um, on such a personal moment, my visit to the strangest named university in the world. And the strangest named university in the world is Peking University, Beijing, because they wish to be recognized as the oldest one, not Beijing 1 to 234 or whatever it is. I had a really good time there. Um, and, you know, we couldn't talk about the present, but the fact that Students all knew about Sun Tzu and could apply it to the present day. I found rather interesting. But, of course, China is nowhere near at the same level now as it was in Confucius's time. Because from the moment that you can't talk about crucial things, 
it's really not worth talking about. So uh, this isn't the best book that I've ever read on China, but it's the one with the most arresting title, I think, The People's Republic of Amnesia. So if in China you attempt to do research which combines nine, six, one, nine, eight, nine, you can't do it because that is the date of Tiananmen Square. Now people talk about um, uh, whistleblowers in the West. I don't think any whistleblower in the West has added to our knowledge nearly as much as those who, who released the Tiananmen uh, papers. So we're now back to Yale. The man who got it most right and uh, continues to get it more right than m many people who write about intelligence is Sherman Kent. Whatever the complex puzzles we strive to solve, Whatever sophisticated techniques we use, there can never be a time when the thoughtful person can be supplanted as the intelligence device supreme. Right on Sherman Kent. 60, 70 years on, he is still the best. Thank you very much. I, I would be very happy to... Um, uh, uh, answer or try to answer, I'd better say try to answer <laughs> questions. I do have a microphone, so if you can wait for me to get to you. Thanks so much for, uh, for a great talk. Um, I'm curious to know when you start making the distinction MI5 and MI6. Yeah. I saw MI5 in, in India and I saw MI5 in. Well, can you enlighten us on, on that? Yes. Um, the, um, uh, the contemporary distinction goes back to the founding of both organizations, which is uh, in, uh, in 1909. Now, so far as operation, uh, operating abroad, the rule at the time when uh, India and other for, former parts of the, of the British Empire became independent was that anything which was, which remained or had been British territory was MI5. And uh, anything which had never been part of the British Empire was MI6 or SIS, which was all pretty crazy uh, because the idea that, um, uh, it, you know, in uh, Africa, neighboring uh, independent states would have different um, uh, British responsibilities. So ever since the, the late 1960s, it has been um, uh, SIS, which uh, MI6, which has the, um, uh, the, the responsibility. But going through all the papers, I don't think anything surprised me more than uh, the response of newly independent parts of the British Empire to maintaining a connection particularly uh, with uh, uh, MI5. So here's just one example. At the beginning of the 1960s, Jomo Kenyatta, uh, the greatest um, independence leader, as I think everybody here knows, um, in the history of uh, West Africa, came over to Britain to settle the final details at Lancaster House of, uh, of independence. Now, if anyone had any right to be um, uh, uh, really, really personally angry with the uh, British authorities during such a negotiation. It was him. He'd been accused, quite wrongly, of being a, a member of Mau Mau. He'd been locked up and so on. And he insists on going to MI5 headquarters. Well, this causes a certain amount of trepidation. But uh, when he turns up, um, Sir Roger Hollis, uh, the then head of um, MI5, he simply says, I've so much enjoyed um, talking to your representative in Nairobi, and so has my um, a daughter, and would you kindly uh, stay on? I think that may have had something to do with the fact that he felt that um, uh, he needed further advice on Oginga Odinga, but um, there we are. Anyway, um, th th that is a, a short, uh, the shortest uh, answer I can give to a question which deserves much longer one. Thank you. Dr. Andrew, you never mentioned Russia. No, I didn't. And I think I, I'm reluctant to ask this because I can't believe I'm so ignorant. Um, how does, doesn't Russia relate to this in any way? Yes, which is why the whole of my third lecture, as announced at the beginning, will be on that subject. Um, it's it's um, simply there wasn't time to include it, but I will, I will give just one, one link between what I say 
I plan to say then, and what I've been saying today, which I don't think preempt, and that is the importance of a long view. The Russians have actually, even though you know, their interpretation of past intelligence is not something that I agree with, they have been far better at um, taking a long view than uh, we have done. I mean, the, the official history, well, the authorized history written by me as official historian of MI5, only goes back to the Victorian era. The official Russian historian, uh, history of foreign intelligence, six volumes, um, I disagree with the interpretation, uh, but I agree with the, uh, the time scale, goes all the way back to, not merely uh, to Ivan the Terrible, but beyond uh, Ivan the Terrible. Thank you much. Hi, yeah, thank you for your talk. Um, so, uh, your, your last slide there uh, reminds me of a question that I've been bubbling up throughout the, the lecture, which is that, uh, how do you see, uh, I wonder if you could elaborate on how the role of technology, in your view, is changing the job of the intelligence officers and intelligence agencies, uh, especially in the 21st century? Well, what it does, of course, is, is to change online jobs, change life. But there's no reason to believe, is there, that it's yet had the, the impact that the invention of printing had uh, in the 15th century. I mean, comparing uh, across several hundred years is, is pretty difficult. But you can see why the inability to come to terms with uh, new methods of uh, IT um, can uh, bring what had previously been a great power down to the also-rans. And this is, after all, what happens to the Ottoman Empire. Not, not simply my view, but uh, Ataturk said exactly the same uh, about them when he gave a, a long view uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the 20th um, century. So the, the, uh, what um, access to the internet does, those countries who try to limit themselves, limit the access of their citizens to it, are condemning themselves to a degree of backwardness which makes some kind of comparison. I mean, history never completely repeats itself, but as people have said, it, um, it, it, it rhymes. So, you know, uh, Chinese uh, uh, universities' uh, research on, contemporary, on the contemporary world lacks the most basic credibility because of the obstacles that are put, which in some ways are reminiscent of the Ottomans, to the, um, uh, the study of sources which are available to all the, all the rest of us. And as I've said, you know, I really, really enjoyed um, going to um, uh, lecture at um, um, Peking University with the contradiction between these people whose understanding of Sun Tzu you know, beat any lecture audience that I would expect to find in Britain uh, when talking about um, uh, classical learning and international relations uh, today, uh, just hit a point beyond which it could not develop. Any other questions? Um, the current uh, American president has uh, been somewhat ambivalent in his relationship with uh, the intelligence agencies who talk of deep state and so on. Is there any yeah. historical precedent for that kind of um, relationship between a ruler and an intelligence agencies? Yes. <laughs> that is the subject of my lecture tomorrow. Or not, 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 not the, um, uh, the, entire, uh, the entire subject. But um, we sort of take it for granted that um, uh, heads of government and heads of state will sort of get on with the intelligence uh, agencies. And when it doesn't happen, this is regarded as, I don't know, something so bizarre, how can we take it in? But there are plenty of previous examples, although talking about the particular individual having scanned the last three or 4,000 years of human history, I find it difficult to draw an exact parallel. <laughs> Any other questions? All right then, thank you Professor Andrew for a very, very interesting presentation. I invite you all to join us upstairs in the common room for a reception.